All right, um, it's time to get started. Welcome again, everybody. My name is Alexi Miller. I'm a co-founder and managing director at DateArt, and I'm very happy to be hosting this webinar together with our partner Salesforce this morning. And we will be talking about Salesforce power of the platform, specifically in financial services. I am very happy to welcome uh, two esteemed panelists today, Tom King, director at Salesforce. Thank you, Tom, and welcome and uh, Russell Karp, Vice President and a leader of Salesforce Center of Excellence at, here at, at DateArt, my, my colleague. Very happy to see or assume that I can see everyone who joined, uh, joined the webinar. Um, today's session is, just as a heads up, today's session is not going to be a very technical one. Those of you who may be expecting uh, some live coding session uh, on the screen may be disappointed. That's not, the, that's not us and that's not the uh, subject of the conversation today. What we wanted to do is, uh, is have a high level, high level conversation uh, about the right way to think about Salesforce platform uh, as a foundation block, as a jumping off point, I guess, to develop sophisticated custom tailored solutions for organizations and financial services. DateArt and Salesforce are two partners who come to this conversation from slightly different angles, and we'll cover those later in the, in the presentation. But the, our overarching idea is to share our experiences, our vision, our advice um, in terms of how to think about Salesforce platform and how to uh, organize your processes, your, your, your uh, teams around this idea of building sophisticated solutions on top of financial services, uh, I'm sorry, on top of Salesforce platform. Um, we will go through a very quick, I promise, introduction of DateArt to get us started, and then um, we will uh, pass it on to, to Tom. So the host of the conversation today is DateArt, and um, as I mentioned, DateArt is in the position we come to this conversation as a builder of custom software. We've been doing this for a long time, about 24 years uh, in, in existence, and the company is doing it all over the world, building sophisticated custom software solutions for clients in a variety of industries, primarily in financial services. We do it at scale with almost 6,000 engineers at this, at this point, about 400 clients, and our claim to fame have for many, many years has been using technologies of various kinds to build sophisticated software solutions from scratch, which is now changing a little bit. And we'll talk more about that in, um, in the next few slides. We come to financial services sort of from three angles of attack. We try to combine our knowledge of technology, our understanding of the subsectors and the issues that are specific to those sectors. In asset management or um, training or payments or insurance, the solutions for this that address certain uh, typical tasks, legacy modernization, getting things done quickly, um, developing new uh, systems from scratch. We believe that by combining those three components, we can be efficient, we can be good guardians of our clients' dollars, and ultimately develop solutions that last in the marketplace. Um, a quick rundown of the typical problems we help clients solve in financial services. Those of you are, who are from organizations uh, in, those, in those sectors will probably recognize some of the typical problems or challenges in your respective sectors, whether it's uh, claims processing and insurance and using the best uh, machine learning technology to automate and speed it up, improve data quality to data warehousing, reporting analytics, dealing with alternative data sources and asset management, or um, implementing new, new digital technologies in the service of payments optimization. At DateArt, as I said, we operate at scale, so we do it, we do it all. There are interesting conversations in all of these um, sectors. Uh, a fintech explosion of interest and investment has been driving enormous um, digital transformation in the payments and retail and uh, commercial banking sector. Uh, asset management is very active in terms of um, technology investment. Insurance is not far behind with massive, massive opportunities. So I think what we will be talking about uh, later in the presentation, although not specific to any of the of these subsectors, is certainly relevant as an overarching picture to so many of us in this in this industry. And so, as I mentioned, at DateArt, we've been proud and very efficient builders of custom software for many, many years. And we've mostly did it from scratch. 
whether or not that's the right approach is something we is, is a question we deal with every single day. And I think what we are coming to realize that the world is, is changing, our clients' demands are changing, the platforms that uh, we partner with are becoming more powerful by the day. And so now um, uh, the, the solution is never fully custom or just buy, the solution is somewhere in between. The right ways to think about it, the right ways to deploy the platform to the use is what we wanna talk about today. So with that in mind, I'll consider data and introduction done. Uh, and I want to pass it on to Tom King, director at Salesforce, who kindly agreed to share Salesforce's vision for financial services with us today. Tom, thank you and welcome. Thanks very much, Alexia. I greatly appreciate it. Um, my name is Tom King. I'm a director in our financial services sector, and I focus specifically on the insurance industry. And our financial services sector uh, does cover capital markets, wealth management, banking, and insurance. And they, all of these sectors are uh, supported by individuals like myself that come from the industry and have years of experience working on specific uh, industry problems and industry solutions that are associated with each of these industries. I'll be talking in general about what we're doing in financial services overall. And if anybody wants to talk about insurance, I could do that with you all day long. Now, the fact is that financial services has been seeing a tremendous amount of acceleration uh, from an ability to support digital processing and to meet the client where they want to be doing business. But what's been happening with the um, uh, COVID shutdown has only accelerated this. And in particular, on supporting the, the employee, because everybody's trying to work virtual as much as possible. Uh, I'm, I actually went to my first office meeting with a client yesterday, and that was the first time I stepped inside of an office building in 18 months. And everybody's trying to figure out how can you work in this new environment. And the one thing it's pointed out across all industries is the amount of manual processes and workarounds that we currently have in place to get our work done day to day. And many companies, insurers, bankers, credit unions, et cetera, are all trying to figure out what can we do to streamline processes, have a single view of the client, and to be able to provide that access that everybody needs, both internally and externally. And the fact is that the customer expectations are evolving. And it's not always necessarily by <clears throat> because of what's happening within um, financial services. It's being driven by what we're seeing in other industries. Just take the entertainment industry. If I can start um, a conversation, or if I can start watching a movie on my phone, move to a tablet and then to my TV and pick up that uh, program exactly where I left off, if I can see all of my users on that account, why can't I have that same level of access to my insurance accounts or my banking accounts, et cetera? So what the clients are expecting is going up tremendously. And it can vary within socioeconomic groups. It can vary within demographics. I was working, uh, I was doing something with my son and he was having a problem with one of the vendors that he uh, bought something from and he was trying to take care of it online. And I said, why don't you just give them a call? And he said to me, dad, I'd rather cut my arm off than actually have to talk to a person. And that's that, that's the way uh, a lot of younger people are looking at it. So being able to support the client and the channel that they want to be supported in is going to be a major issue for anybody that's trying to do business out there today. And the fact is our organizations and the regulatory environment is becoming increasingly complex, especially around privacy. And what we don't want to have to do is just rely upon our people to know what is the privacy regulations or what they're supposed to be doing from a processing perspective. As much as we can build into the underlying support systems to take it off of the plate of our employee and have the systems manage that process, we're more likely to stay in compliance and to show the regulators that we are doing the due diligence to follow all of the regulations as they're put forward will help avoid fines and make it easier to work in this environment going forward. I almost kind of think that the whole idea of the customer 360 is, might be misnamed a little bit. Honestly, it should be party 360. 
Because yes, when we first look at being able to manage our business, we want to know what can we do to support our clients and what business are they bringing to the table? Because what you don't want to do is look at your individual clients as separate products. You want to look at them as a holistic whole and have visibility into all of the products that they have with you. But the same is true for the channels that you're doing business with. It doesn't matter which line of financial services you're in. Everybody works with third-party providers, whether they're brokers, whether they're intermediaries, whether they're uh, um, wholesalers, et cetera. Having that 360-degree view of your channels is as important as having the 360-degree view of your clients. In the insurance space, when an insurer is working with an agent or a broker, they want to know what's the quality of the book of business that they're bringing in. Are they bringing us profitable business or are they only giving us the stuff that nobody else will take? Or are they using the insurer to block the market so that other brokers or agents couldn't bring the same risk in? And there are similar sorts of issues in other sectors of financial services. So having that 360 degree view of your channels is as important as having the 360 degree view of your client. And just to speak about the client for a second, it's more than just having a view of what type of business are they doing with you. So that for example, I'm 59 years old. I have a, uh, I'm married, I have a couple of kids. I have multiple products across the financial services sector. And when I call in to my bank or to my insurer or to my credit union, do they view me, first of all, as an account level with all of those different pieces of it? But what is the information that they're putting on top of that? How are they using analytics to determine what type of a customer I am? Because when I call in, do they realize I work in the software industry? The software industry wasn't hit as hard as other industries in uh, during the COVID shutdown. My brother, however, he's in the restaurant business. And the restaurant business, as you know, got decimated during the uh, shutdown. So, and we're the same demographic age. He's a year younger than me, but he's married with kids also. Are, when I call into one of my financial institutions, are they going to treat me with the same sort of processes and care as they are my brother? I might be a good uh, opportunity for an upsell or a cross sell. My brother, they're looking at a retention risk. He might be short on cash. What can they do to help him get through uh, the financial shutdown, through the uh, COVID shutdown? This is where analytics and data and insight play a role into the customer 360 over and above just having that account level view of who the client is. And honestly, I could spend my entire time just talking about this one slide here. And I've touched upon some of these points already. Digital 3.0 talks about omni-channel experiences. Everybody wants to be able to use the channel that they see that fits the best. But the fact is, we also need to be able to make sure those channels work together. And there's a big difference between omni-channel and multi-channel. Multi-channel means that you support different channels like online or mobile or contact center, et cetera. But often in a multi-channel environment, your supporting solutions are developed by independent teams that can um, uh, take a look at the specs and interpret them differently. And the results are going to be different experiences, not great. And usually in a multi-channel environment, when you move from one channel to the other, you often have to start over. In an omni-channel experience, you develop a solution once and you roll it out across multiple channels. And then as you roll these channels out, in a true omni-channel fashion, you can move from one channel to another without having to start over and have the same exact user experience. And if the user experience is different in an omni-channel solution, it's because you as the organization has made a decision to change it not because two different development teams interpreted those uh, specs differently. So Omnichannel a couple of years ago was a competitive differentiator. Today, it's becoming 
table stakes. You have to have it. And that ties directly into connected service and automation. The fact is too many times in financial services companies, the process is not straight through or is not fully automated where steps are, are going from one person to another or pulling data together across different systems. It's a start and start process, start and stop process where the processing is chunked up into multiple different pieces. Even though you might have to have an individual included as part of a process, it's not all gonna be fully automated. You need to have a straight through process where you can create a full end to end solution that is going to guide the user and the different participants through the entire process and manage the data associated with that across the entire process and provide visibility into the different users so they can see where everything is pulling together. And that kind of ties into the whole intelligence and empathy thing, like as I was just mentioning before. If you're talking about a contact center, for example, when a contact center rep starts a new call, they have what, maybe 30 seconds to kind of figure out, is this a happy client or is this an unhappy client? Is this somebody that we can do an upsell or cross sell to like myself, or is this a retention risk like my brother that I mentioned earlier? You need to be able to use analytics and data to be able to take the information that's available on any client that you're doing business with as much or as little as you have and be able to prompt your customer service reps or whoever's dealing with the client to give them the best intelligence that you can provide so that they can work with your client, with your uh, brokers, with your agent in an empathetic manner so that you know where they're coming from and you can make the best recommendation possible. And that ties into the whole idea of proactive service. So that during the shutdown, for example, most automobile insurers were able to give back money to their insureds because they weren't uh, driving. And insurance companies were gonna be making scads of money and the right thing to do was to return some of that premium to clients. But at the same point, what can you do to tie your client more tightly to you or tie your agent or broker to you more uh, tightly with proactive service? So that knowing that my brother's in the uh, restaurant business, what could the insurers have done or their banks or their credit unions done to reach out to him to say, hey, we know you're going through a tough time. Here are some ideas that we'd like to work with you on to make sure that you get through this, uh, uh, this hardship in a very successful manner. That helps create customer loyalty and long-term customer success. Now, I've been with Salesforce for about two years. And I have to say, what attracted me to Salesforce is the investment that Salesforce is making in financial services. And a good chunk of that investment is in what we call the financial services cloud. It is the basis from which we are developing all of our solution sets to support all of the industries that's part of financial services. So that includes wealth management, insurance, banking, and lending. And we develop in layers here at Salesforce so that every Salesforce product starts with the customer 360 in the Lightning platform. And then on top of that, we have the, um, the sales cloud and the service cloud that takes advantage of all of the capabilities built into the platform. We built financial services cloud on top of sales and service so that this way here, we inherit all of the capabilities that are coming to market with those products as they develop. And then we built out the specific requirements for each of the sub verticals within financial services. So we have separate data models to support wealth management, insurance, banking, and lending. And that's very important because in a lot of uh, areas across the world, many companies work across those. So if you're an insurer or if you're a bank within uh, the US, you might not need all of that capability, but if you're doing work outside of the US, you probably will. But the fact is, it's all there. And as we develop our industry-specific solutions, such as in insurance, we have claims and we have policy admin, 
those are all built off of financial services cloud. And so in banking, lending, and wealth management, as we built out our solutions for those sectors, we are building all of those on top of FSC or financial services cloud. Now, the one key thing I'd like you to keep in mind about Salesforce is that we release upgrades three times a year. And this is not like a traditional software package where you actually have to go through an upgrade process to be able to take advantage of these upgrades. They're automatically available to you and they're there. And then you can just decide how or if you're going to use those new capabilities. And this is true for all Salesforce products. Now, what I love about this model of software as a service is it helps our clients avoid what I call the legacy trap. One of the reasons why financial services companies have moved away from building uh, core solutions in-house and have moved to buying solutions they could buy off the shelf is that often, even though you might build a solution in-house and it could be the best thing since sliced bread day one, most organizations do not have the appetite for investment to continue to invest in the underlying technology. That is why the industry is littered with COBOL systems that are 30, 40 years old. Because as those systems age, the financial services companies did not have the appetite to re-platform it on new technology. That's where software providers come in. They should be investing in those underlying technologies so that you don't have to. You just have to take advantage of it. And when you get to software as a service as opposed to a traditional install and then have to re-upgrade, the overall process for maintaining those solutions becomes a lot easier and taking upgrades becomes a lot easier so that you don't have to do a massive upgrade every three or four years that you have to cost justify and figure out is it worth it, et cetera. You just need to be able to take advantage of capability as it's rolled out from um, the three releases each year. Now, we have tremendous uh, footprints in all of the sectors within financial services cloud. As you can see here, uh, we have many of the, the, the major brands and we work with each type of client in the manner that meets their specific requirements whether it's a core solution or a contact solution, et cetera. So that, for example, with Pacific Life, they were looking to be able to have visibility across their different lines of business so that they could go back to their agents and brokers and say, hey, here's where your clients sit. We think there's some great upsell, cross-sell capabilities here, and we're able to provide warm leads back to their distribution channels. But one that I'd like to talk about is in the banking sector, and it's a great example of where Salesforce has enabled our client to be able to change the way that they're doing business with their client, and that's Rocket Mortgage. We started our relationship with Rocket Mortgage where we were able to help them tie together all of the data that were in their underlying core system, some of which you know, uh, maybe might not have been the most uh, up-to-date solution. But we were able to pull all that information together and give them a single view of the client, and then to create a straight through one-click mortgage process. They were so successful with that, they are now offering that out to other banks and credit unions that might not have mortgage operations or don't want to support mortgage operations and would rather work with a partner. So anybody that wants to do business with Rock and Mortgage can install their one-click mortgage process in their offices or on their website and working with their loan origination officers, start the mortgage process with their clients, but execute through Rocket Mortgage. If you wanna learn more about this, Rocket Mortgage actually put this out in a press release um, at the end of October, uh, October 29th, I believe it was. And one of the key things, this slide and the next slide are two of the key things I want you to walk away with. And the first is that digital transformation is not a big bang project. It's a process. And it's the way that you need to start managing your business. I chose a distribution management transformation plan here as an example. Each of these individual circles are one small project, something that you could do 
uh, or manage within three to six months. And the whole idea here is that you should constantly be renovating the way that you're doing business. You should have a strategy that's, that, that, that sticks out two to three years. And the whole idea is as your market changes or as your business changes, you are able to reschedule how these circles are going to be addressed. And when you're done with these 10 circles, there should be 10 more lined up. The whole idea with digital transformation is it never stops. You're always looking for the next tweak that you can do to your systems or do to your business. And it all should be done in three to six month chunks, six months at the outside. We love to be able to go in and have projects up and running in four to six weeks. Something that helps generate excitement within the organization, generate success, and often can make these projects uh, self-sustained. And the other message I want you to walk away with is that with Salesforce, we can work with you in the manner that best fits your current strategy and how you want to be able to work with us going forward. Quite often, a lot of our clients just want to help with a guided digital experience. And this could be Experience Cloud providing an external uh, portal or supporting mobile operations or be able to give your clients or your distribution channels access to their data, all front end. Where we often wind up playing a major role is in the middle office, where we're that single pane of glass that is tying all of your processes together so that your users only have to go to one screen. If you've ever sat down in a customer service center and watched their people work, uh, it, you can have a seizure watching these people flip from one screen to the other, because they often have nine, 10 screens open, trying to figure out what system do they need to be in to support this customer. And whenever a customer service rep says, I'm sorry, my system is a little slow today, what they really mean is I'm trying to figure out what system do I need to be in to support you. With Salesforce, we can pull all of those different systems together and manage the end-to-end -end process that all of those systems need to create that solution to support your clients and extend that single pane of glass out to the users that need it. That's where we have really grown up and have a tremendous amount of capability to help you provide that seamless experience. And now we've been investing in the core solutions on the right-hand side. So in the insurance space, if you're looking for uh, claims, or if you're looking for policy admin, we can help you manage that entire process going forward. So working with your sales reps and our, uh, uh, our customer success teams, we can help craft the strategy that makes sense for what you need to get done today. So I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Alexei to uh, introduce the next subject. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Russell Karp, my colleague here at DataArt and a leader of DataArt Salesforce Center of Excellence, who will give this all some color in terms of what DataArt is doing. Thank you, Russell. Yep. Uh, thank you, Alexei. Uh, thank you, Tom, for a great overview and insight into um, how financial services plays within the Salesforce ecosystem. Yeah, so <clears throat> about data art and how we fit in uh, into everything that's been presented to you so far today. So we are a Salesforce partner. We have been for several years. Um, we provide services pretty much across the board um, from digital transformation, as Tom mentioned, you know, kind of as a, as a process along the way of uh, architecting and designing uh, your Salesforce solution. And we also have services around uh, integrating data uh, using either custom solutions or platforms uh, such as uh, MuleSoft um, and so forth. And uh, one thing that we do play, uh, pay close attention, close attention to uh, are Salesforce and industry best practices in all of our projects. So in terms of uh, clouds and platforms uh, where we have significant depth, um, financial service cloud, uh, we're one of the few partners who uh, actually have what Salesforce calls a, a super badge. Um, it's not a full certification, but it's the closest thing to certification. And the only thing that's available today is the financial service cloud uh, accreditation. And also across <clears throat> kind of the, you know, what I call the standard cloud sales service, 
uh, experience, which used to be community cloud and the marketing cloud. Um, we've also uh, lately had significant a significant entry into uh, the Tableau CRM world as well. Um, we have a super badge with uh, for Einstein Analytics, um, which was uh, or for Tableau CRM, which was known as uh, Einstein Analytics. So. Uh, as you can see at the bottom, uh, specializations around uh, FSC, which is a financial service cloud, uh, sales cloud expertise, and Einstein. Um, in terms of services, you know these are pretty standard services across the board, but we can just run through them really quick for the audience to get you know kind of the uh, the breadth of you know what uh, services they can uh, 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 eventually. Uh, leverage from uh, from data art so uh, we have discovery services which is mostly focused on uh, you know business analysis it's focused on uh, architectural review um, we also as i mentioned previously do uh, the design and development work uh, we also build custom apps on top of force.com uh, in addition to lightning components um, some of the kind of uh, turnkey solutions that we have are around new implementations and migrations from other competing platforms. Uh, we've done a number of those and we've actually have done a significant one internally. Uh, they went very well. Um, and uh, also around uh, analytics. So uh, anything from Salesforce reporting and dashboards to uh, utilizing uh, Tableau and, and Einstein. And more focus kind of on the, de on the uh, deployment side, uh, you know, we have processes for release management, um, CI, CD, which is focused on DevOps and ongoing uh, administration enhancement support. So once we complete an implementation, you know, we, we don't go away, we provide ongoing support uh, as needed for all of our clients. Um, our team uh, has grown significantly, uh, to say the least within the past, I would say 18 months or so. Um, and we all of our consultants are certified uh, across uh, all the clouds that I mentioned: sales, service, experience, marketing, a whole bunch of others. And we have super badges as well. Some of the icons you see there at the bottom uh, are just a subset of all the other badges that we've gathered over time. Um, our team also includes uh, senior architects, analysts, developers, and administrators. So, um, you know, one uh, area of focus during the pandemic has been attaining talent at the senior level. Uh, and we actually have done an excellent job uh, as a practice in terms of finding the right folks uh, to perform in those roles. Um, so the, the next two slides focus on some uh, business cases, uh, some clients and financial services that uh, went through uh, uh, some interesting transformation. Uh, so I thought I would like to share that with you. Um, this first client is a foreign exchange firm. Uh, this was a sales cloud implementation. Uh, some of the challenges they faced was that they built an in-house system. And as they grew, <clears throat> uh, they realized that uh, you know, the features and functionality they built in was not complying not only with their CRM principles, but principles, but also with their uh, evolving uh, processes. Uh, they also found that anytime they had to uh, add a new feature or do an upgrade, it was always very time consuming, pricey, and sometimes error prone. And some some basic tasks like reporting uh, were were cumbersome and really not intuitive. So uh, the solution was. Uh, we deployed uh, uh, analysts and architects to go through a discovery phase to really find out, you know, what what are the pain points. Uh, also identify what the processes were, um, and also uh, focus on you know some of the the features that they would like to uh, migrate. Not obviously from one platform to another, but continue using and what new features they would like to have in in the implementation of Salesforce. Um, so we spent a lot of time working on the UI because what we learned was that um, just working with the system was 
really not, not intuitive. So we focused on what the user experience was going to be with the goal of uh, reaching very high user adoption. Um, additionally, we configured Einstein AI, um, automate and support call to action activities and, and kind of focus folks on top priority opportunities. Um, we also uh, implemented a middleware solution um, that supported two-way synchronization between Salesforce and their other internal systems. So ba basically at the end of the day, um, they had a single platform with access to all the data that they needed and presented um, in a way that was understandable to all users. Uh, some of the benefits that the client gained was, uh, as I mentioned, high user adoption by the sales team. Uh, you know, th that's the key. If the user adoption is, uh, is low, I mean, it, it's not a successful project. Um, so the, they were very happy to see that user adoption was significantly higher than their previous platform. Uh, we implemented, uh, they started using Lightning, uh, which was a big improvement of uh, what they had before in their homegrown system. Uh, they finally had a stable two-way integration with their back office systems. Uh, they, they inherited just by using the Salesforce platform uh, flexibility to introduce new applications, uh, basically either building custom applications on top of Salesforce or using App Exchange for any gaps in functionality that they currently had. Um, and there were other things around automation and uh, uh, overall, you know, team performance uh, saw significant improvement and the reporting and KPI visibility um, was uh, uh, also uh, increased. This was actually what I call like a, a rescue project. So this is for an investment professionals organization. Um, they had Salesforce, uh, but they had issues um, deploying new features or functionality. Uh, there were kind of issues in terms of uh, you know, not only the deployment process, but also when things were deployed, there were, there were errors. Things weren't working the way users expected it to work. Uh, they were still on Salesforce Classic and not leveraging the power of Lightning. Um, and new capabilities <clears throat> uh, were not being used, which reduced efficiency across the board. So uh, our solution was, uh, again, we, de we deployed kind of a similar team as to the previous case study, where we had architects, developers, and analysts uh, that we integrated with their in-house team. So they already had uh, a team of Salesforce uh, developers and architects internally, and we enhanced their team in terms of providing them with, uh, with guidance and helping them develop uh, the solution eventually. So we planned and eventually deployed a lightning strategy, uh, take advantage of such things as dynamic forms, uh, permission set groups, that's more around security. We built lightning web components um, and change data capture, which is more around auditing. Um, we also developed a DevOps strategy for them and implemented using Salesforce best practices. So this significantly enhanced uh, kind of time to market in terms of new features and capabilities. Um, some of the benefits they realized were, uh, again, user adoption, that's always the key. Um, substantially increased their efficiency around their internal processes, uh, which improved team performance. Uh, they reduced cost uh, because they spent less time uh, working on issues with deployments and fixing bugs with whatever they deployed previously. Um, and we also implemented uh, CI, CD uh, processes and, and, and procedures, which uh, kind of made, again, th this entire uh, ideation of a new feature to go live of the new feature uh, significantly uh, quicker. This is extremely high level, uh, but we just want to kind of uh, illustrate like what, what are the successful building blocks uh, you know, for a, a Salesforce program. Um, and if you look at um, the key here, so the yellow is the responsibility of the client team. The green is, is the partner team, data art in this case, and the blue is 
is how we is the areas where we work together. So initially uh, important to set goals and, and what your success criteria will be. So when we're uh, about to go live, we like to compare that, uh, or after we go live, apologies, uh, that we can measure success criteria in terms of you know how the system is performing. Uh, also extremely important is the change management and user adoption strategy. So whether we're moving from another platform or a new implementation, user adoption, training, change management, very, very important things to focus on. Um, important to have internal stakeholders. So who from the client side is kind of responsible for the guidance uh, of, the, uh, of the program? Um, once we have those things in place, then we can go ahead and, and build out the implementation plan and timelines. Um, and as we kind of dig deeper into the project, you know, we start identifying processes, gather requirements, building out use cases, setting up our sprints and so forth, all around project planning. And then we actually do uh, the development work. So uh, build, test, iterate. I mean, that's a kind of a endless loop uh, until we uh, you know, have finished off all of our use cases. Uh, and then uh, we move on to training, which is fed from our change management and user adoption strategy. And then we go live and we kind of support, uh, uh, you know, the uh, implementation once they're live. So in a nutshell, I know this is, I went through this pretty quick. It's very high level there. You can, I'm sure you can imagine there are significant layers within each of these circles, but we identified these as kind of the key areas to focus on with any Salesforce implementation. Uh, Alexi, did, did you want to Thank moderate? you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Russell and, and Tom for the presentations. Um, great stuff. And indeed, we do have a, a, a range of questions uh, coming in here. I know Tom already answered uh, a couple of them in, in chat. Tom is multitasking, that's always appreciated, but I'll, I'll um, take the liberty of very quickly repeating couple of questions for everyone's benefit here. One question was whether Salesforce is developing or considering developing a, 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 a solution specifically for the investment process, capital rising um, being, being one use case and uh, obviously very hot topic these days. And Tom was kind enough to point out that there is already a solution for corporate and investment bankers. And for those interested, there is a link in, in chat. I don't know, Tom, if you wanna add any color with respect to if I'm an organization, a, a FinTech startup, for example, and I'm looking for a, for a fundraising process, is there a solution for sort of the end user for that versus the, versus the bankers? Any additional color on, on that answer? Uh, just, if, I just want to check to make sure I was off mute. Um, not much else to add, except for the fact that the processes and the data uh, would be specific to that entire sector. And uh, they've been building this out for quite a while now. And I think that if you took a look at it, you would be uh, very interested in, in what you say. Fair enough. Thank you. And I can attest because some of some of the arts clients and mid mid-sized uh, investment investment banks, so I know for a fact we're relying on Salesforce for some of those basic research CRM investor, they call it IRM, investor relationship management processes. So the solution is definitely out there in the field. Especially in a market like that, where quite often you're you're relying upon the individual investment banker to manage a process. And even though they might be very brilliant at crafting deals, et cetera to create a repeatable process or to make sure that you have access to all of the data that's associated with the deal or multiple uh, partners you might be doing with, uh, that's difficult. So being able to put a framework around it that helps support your investment bankers without stifling their creativity is something that that sector is just very, very hungry for. Indeed. So the other question was uh, about the, the nature of the relationship between Salesforce and, and, and DataArt. Now, um, Tom, thank you for providing some color in the in the text box there, but I'll just add that indeed, DataArt is an independent custom software engineering firm that develops solutions on top of partner platforms such as Salesforce. And we, incre we see increasing demand in the marketplace for custom systems built on top of the platform. That's, what we, that's, that's our role. We help clients integrate it build custom systems on top of it, advise it when certain solution is appropriate and, and, and so forth. But obviously we're a separate, separate company and Salesforce is much more of a platform 
uh, versus data art as a custom custom builder. Um, the, the other question that I had coming in was, uh, and I want to direct it to both of you, feel free to take it in whatever, whatever order. Um, it was mentioned a couple of times, this, this notion of efficiency, that it's more efficient to, to, to integrate. Uh, maybe Tom, starting with you, what is Salesforce's thinking on how to evaluate the, the notion of price, the total cost of ownership of a solution built on top of a, a platform such as Salesforce and timing wise, because as you've mentioned, things change so fast that what you build today, may you may have to rebuild all together in, uh, in, in two years time. Is there a sort of a template or sort of suggested thinking that Salesforce offers to, to, to evaluate the return on investment? Uh, what we, what we definitely like to do is we like to tailor that to the individual organization. And while we do have standard processes that we go through, what the outcome is can vary tremendously from one client to another. So that, for example, are they a leader in their marketplace and is their growth stable, but not going to be exponential? So that uh, if, if you are a major market player and you have 60% of the market, could you get it up to 90? Probably not. Do you want to conserve your market? Yes. Do you want to be able to make it more efficient? Yes. So how we would approach them uh, and the value drivers that we would identify would be much different than a company that is a growth company. Let's suppose it's a regional company that wants to become a super regional country. Uh, company and go into more states. How you would address that from a growth perspective is much different than if it is uh, a large market player, or possibly if we're going into new lines of business and need to be able to develop new solutions to support it, and at the same time be able to create that customer 360 I talked about at length for. Each of those uh, different strategies from a business perspective would have different value drivers. And one of the things our client teams work very closely with the client on is figuring out what are the value drivers that they're concerned about and how can Salesforce support it. And one of the things that I hear on a regular basis is that we want to be able to grow, but we don't want to have to add to staff. That whole model, and it used to be, especially in the insurance industry, if you wanted to improve customer service, the only way you could do it was to throw bodies at it. Today, you can improve customer service tremendously and actually do it with less people by being able to provide access to all of the data for an individual and all of their accounts, by being able to offer um, online self-service, by being able to provide tools to help your people manage work much more effectively without having to do swivel chair processing. Those are some of the core areas that just about everybody wants to address. And then on top of that, you have the strategic issues that I mentioned earlier. Russell, I, I was wondering in your experience, uh, 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 talking to clients who are sort of early on in their, in their Salesforce journey, when the questions of both cost and what I imagine the platform lock-in um, come up, such as you build it on top of a platform, you're stuck forever. How do you help clients deal with that? What are the trade-offs that you walk them through? Uh, well, the biggest one, and I think Tom mentioned that early on, was um, the support and maintenance and enhancements that Salesforce upgrades their platform uh, three times a year. So the clients are getting new features, capabilities, really at, at no additional cost than, than what the, the, the subscription model is. Um, and uh, you know, that, that's a big differentiator compared to if you're building something uh, in-house uh, or some of the com competing platforms. There was a very interesting slide, Tom, uh, somewhere in the middle of your presentation with the layered structure of the Salesforce financial services platform, starting from the very basic uh, customer 360 view all the way to the, uh, the 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 partners systems that are, they automate or support some very high level of processes yeah we just had it flip uh, on, on the screen so tom i i was wondering if those regular regular updates um first of all do you do you do you publish what's coming do you uh, upgrade it throughout this sort of stack 
this layered structure that we saw a second ago on the screen, how should future Salesforce users or current Salesforce users think about expecting the new? How do, how do they get notified? How do they sort of decide what to invest in the custom solution versus to expect in the next release from Salesforce, for example? Well, there are, we generally have um, uh, release notes that come out every um, uh, three times a year that are identifying what's new in each release. And we actually have uh, client advisory groups where we gather feedback from our clients on what they want to see in the, pro in the client, I'm sorry, in the solution stack. And that drives a lot of the functionality that we're building out. So that, for example, in the insurance space, we heard loud and clear that they wanted an augmented uh, data model for the insurance industry. And they wanted augmented roles for underwriters, for claim adjusters, et cetera. And there are similar feedback loops from each of the different industries to make sure that we're putting the investment in the product that the client wants. Now, we don't put everything in the financial services cloud because not everybody wants everything. So that, as I mentioned earlier, we have a claim solution that's built on top of financial services cloud, and that's a different license. And the same thing for policy administration. Why? Because uh, a lot of clients have solutions that they already have in place that they want to be able to leverage. So Salesforce is not going to force them to run all of their business or all of their processes on Salesforce. Financial Services Cloud is a great building block for being able to tie processes together, to have um, uh, different roles with different type, types of capabilities built into it, and then leverage the other systems that um, our clients already have in place, regardless of whether it's banking, credit solutions, um, investment management, as somebody mentioned earlier, and insurance. So the whole idea is this is a great starting place that gives you a tremendous amount of capability because this is our sales and service desk for the financial services industry. And then you can build or attach from here. I think, yeah, this is um, an area from speaking from experience, talking to clients, there is still quite a bit of confusion as, as to what is the starting place? What is the end point? A lot of the business, a lot of the IT people like to think uh, about a solution as a starting point and love the idea of building further. Well, well the business who's paying top dollar for a solution, it likes to think that they are getting out of the box what they've paid for and have relative little patience for the, the, the follow on development. So I, I know from many um, many of, of our, it's always a delicate balance to, to convince the business to both wait and pay up and for IT to find this optimal path of using something. I think we have um, time for maybe one more question, which I want to throw at, uh, at Russell. Uh, Russell, the, uh, one of the limiting factors, I think, in the um, Salesforce ecosystem is resource supply right now. You, know, you, you have to have certain skills to work on this platform. And I know those are in short supply, getting expensive in this country and all over the world. What, what's your advice for clients to, 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 to how to think about it, um, how to train people? What is the pathway for someone to get from zero to being efficient engineer on the platform? How to think about the partners, such as DataArt and beyond, of course, as uh, suppliers of uh, such skilled uh, teams. What do you see on the resource supply side? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. It, it, it is extremely competitive, not, not only domestically, but also internationally. Um, and, you know, I have to say that we, we've done a, a pretty good job in terms of bringing in some good talent. Uh, but for clients, you know, our role, again, is an implementation partner, right? So um, once a client decides to go the Salesforce route, they'll, they'll bring somebody like Data Art, hopefully Data Art, in um, to help them implement the solution. Now, when we are done in terms of, um, you know, deploying Salesforce, bringing the client live, uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, uh, you know we uh, are able to provide ongoing support. However, it's, it's important for the client to have some uh, in-house support as well. Uh, typically, somebody in the role of a Salesforce administrator, maybe not a full-fledged developer, but somebody who can, you know, go in and do some uh, maintenance work, 
or do some administrative work like uh, you know add new users uh, tweak the security model a little bit uh, make some configuration changes to uh, pages uh, create reports and such but once you know it gets into more kind of complex areas like you know building integrations or or custom web components uh, that's something that uh, an area where we usually come in and provide support. So thank you but so much. Of, yeah, in terms of training, Salesforce actually has an excellent uh, uh, training uh, 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 options uh, using you know, Trailhead or Trailblazer. Uh, there's a, a topic pretty much for everything that Salesforce offers there. And it's a, a great place for folks to learn. Thank you so much. And we are with that, we're at the top of the hour and um, we have to wrap up here. Thank you so much, Tom, again, director at Salesforce for the overview of the Salesforce capability. Thank you, Russell, my colleague and data art Salesforce practice leader for overview of what we do for clients. I hope it was interesting for the audience. Please come again. Thanks to you, everyone, and have a great day.